The following episode of The Basement Surge is brought to you by Paramount Plus and Surge Media. All right, guys, on this episode of The Basement Surge, we're talking about marketing, branding, and our family. Our dads play a big part in this episode, so you're not going to want to miss it. We talk about the Jerry Springer show. We talk about court TV. We talk about marketing and branding and personal branding versus business branding. And just this is one huge marketing episode and I can't wait to get into it. All that and more coming up on the basement soon. Let's go. Turn up the volume, the volume. From the basement of the Empire State. This is the Basement Surge. Three, two, one. Welcome back to the Basement Surge. Thank you for joining me this week, everybody. This is going to be a great episode. But before we get started, do me a favor and hit that subscribe button. Give me a thumbs up, ring a bell, tap the plus button, hit whatever button you got to hit to get notified of fresh episodes of the Basement Surge. And if you'd like to listen to us on the drive to work while you're doing the dishes or picking up the kids as a podcast, make sure you follow the companion podcast of this show, Surgecast, on all major podcast listening apps. Like I said, this is a very special episode of Surge. I have on a guest who runs a show called Better Call Daddy with her dad. So who better to bring into the studio and introduce her but my own father, John. Dad, how's it going? Hey, that's me, father. <laughs> hey, actually, it's going really well. But I got to thank you. I got to thank you for inviting me over to the podcast tonight. I'm yeah. really impressed. Really, really am. This, this is really like the first time you've ever, I think, been on here. Yes. Yes, it is. That's why. I was looking forward to this. Actually, when you asked me, hey, can you come on over? I was like, yeah, definitely. I'm going to do this. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, uh, you and I have been through so many adventures together, you know, and I just love it continuing. So this is uh, really a nice ride. Awesome. awesome. Uh, <laughs> yeah, because I know you like all this stuff, like the, the, all the tech oh, and like love audio. It, love and, it, love it, love yeah. it. Yeah, I love it. Uh, that's you and me always had certain things in common. Uh, here's just another one. Yeah. So, But uh, what you've done with this and uh, the guests that you have on board... Yo, and uh, I've already read who you have me on board as far as uh, me trying to introduce them. Hey, yep. I'm impressed as well. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I'm excited, so let's get into it. Dad, why don't you take it away? Uh, okay, will do. Well, the guest John talks to this week started her career on the Jerry Springer Show over 20 years ago and worked behind the scenes as a producer on various TV shows like Judge Alex and Divorce Court. That's wild. Right. That's why these are shows that I've watched. Yeah. Uh, she's worked for MTV, which, oh my God, that's just in, right in my era. Core TV and Nanny 911. Currently, she's doing a podcast called Better Call Daddy with her father, where she talks to interesting people with inspirational stories. And her father lends his wisdom at the end, as all fathers do. So that's really, uh, that's excellent. Uh, today, John is talking to Rena Friedman Watts from Better Call Daddy. Let's get into the interview. All right, uh, Rena, let's uh, let's get into this because I, I want to start with you with talking about your dad, okay? Because I, yeah. I think I think everything you do stems from your father, okay? And so t- tell me a little bit about your growing up because for me, when I was on your show, I had explained to you that I got my entrepreneurial spirit from my father, right? Uh, he, he had started a business and it kind of put the bug in me. Uh, tell me a little bit about your dad. Did he start a business when you were younger? Yeah, he actually was in business with his parents my entire life. And so when you see that as possible and and when you see that as an option, I definitely think it helps you know that if you're not fit for corporate America, you can do your own thing. (laughs) I mean... (laughs) <laughs> if you don't have that as an example, you can arrive at the same conclusion. But if you see somebody successfully doing that, it kind of makes you think, wow, I don't have to fit the mold. <laughs> Maybe I could do it too. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And so he was in business with his parents for 40 plus years and they ran a factory. It started in Kentucky and then they took it across the river to Indiana so they could expand. They were in the lighting manufacturing 
space where they made lighting reflectors. They actually made reflectors for, you know, even buildings in New York, which is crazy. My, my grandfather did the lights on Broadway and, you know, he had, wow. he had a real admiration for the arts that I think planted a seed as well, where, you know, I used to like to sing for my grandparents and put on performances for them because they would take their hats off to me and they loved music. They always had their record player going in their bedroom and you know they took me to off-Broadway performances you know like it was called Derby Dinner Playhouse and they would sing all the greats and I did that with my parents and my grandparents so they planted a seed of loving the arts loving music and also entrepreneurship being scrappy I mean they went to different auctions and bought equipment cheap and they fixed stuff up and they made it work and they hired people honestly off the streets people out of prison and you know, uh, blue collar workers. Wow. And my grandfather and dad knew how to work every position in the factory. So not only were they giving people an opportunity to work, but they were in the trenches with them. And that's something that I've learned in my own business is that you really need to know how to do all yes. elements of your business. But, you know, if there's parts that you're better at that you more enjoy, I would focus there and then get some virtual assistants or people to do the stuff that, you know, you know, the grunt work, the stuff that you might not have time to do if you right. want to produce more. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm a firm believer in, you know, I think the owner or the CEO, because I've worked with a couple of people who basically stay on their high horse and don't do the lower positions, you know, yeah. and, and, and it's kind of like, I, I always thought that the, the owner and the boss should know how to work every single position within the company you know, at, at least for a little bit this way, you know, not for nothing, but you, you, sometimes the employees, you know, you know, they could be slow or whatever, and you can know, all right, well, you know, this should take you this amount of time, you know, so you know how things work within your company. And it, it, it can only help, I think, you know. It can oh, only... yeah, 100%. And, you know, my dad has had people that have worked for him for generations. And, now, even though he's sold off all his equipment and he's more working in like a consultant capacity, there are people that worked for my dad for 20 years that set up little shops of their own. And since he had relationships in the lighting industry, he's now working for them. Wow. He's now, you know, helping awesome. them with their sales and helping them collect the money and helping them with relationship management and, you know, getting like a 10% consultant fee here and there. But he is still working with people that actually worked for him. Nice. So I love it. He's recreated himself. And to be honest, I'm helping my dad with little things like online invoicing or making his invoice more pretty or how to use chat GPT to actually respond in a better way. <laughs> <laughs> I, I help my father too all the time with technology, you know, it, yeah. it, must, it must be a generational thing. <laughs> Yeah. And it's funny, too, because people are like, what do you record on? I'm like, for my clients or with my dad? Because like Zoom is easy for my dad and easy for people of my dad's generation. It has right. just become the standard. And if I have a client, I use Riverside or StreamYard or something with better quality. But it's cool. Like in the beginning, when me and my dad started recording together, literally, he put on those Apple earbud things with the mic. Sure. And that worked for many episodes. I just wanted to get them started and see if this was even going to work or take or people were going to want to be a part of it. And then I bought him a Yeti mic because that was easy for him to take with him when he's taking care of his mom. And I upgraded my mic to an MV7 Sure mic, right? Mm -hmm. Like it doesn't have to be perfect. I'm truthfully even embarrassed of some of <laughs> what I've put out there, but I, I have gotten so are. much more comfortable. <laughs> And, and my dad, too. Like, I am so proud of this project that me and my dad are doing together. He has gotten better at even his thoughtful responses and how deep he goes into these episodes and remembering that he needs to answer the question of what the guests ask my dad at the end of every episode. Like, sometimes I forget. I'm like, hey, did they ask you a question? He's like, yep, let's start with that. <laughs> I, I, that's great because I, I think I think it's amazing that how podcasting or just sitting behind the microphone, you know, can can change a person from kind of being because because I know in my own personal experience I was very shy. I was very you know like just 
I was very shy. <laughs> and, uh, and when I started podcasting, it was like my personality came out. Like I got more confident in myself, you know, and, uh, I figured out how to use the technology and you know, what sounded the best. So, you know, and I figured out what to do. And it sounds like your dad had done the same thing. Oh my God. It's really funny too. Cause we've, we're now trying to work on our YouTube presence because we had on a guest her name is uh, Relatable Reese and she left Scientology and she has a big YouTube following. And for me putting that one video up there, it like literally doubled my subscribers. And so I was like, dad, remember to keep your chin in the frame. And so now every time we record a reaction, he's like, is my chin in the frame? Is my my chin good? And it's going to probably be in a couple of the reactions of him even saying that because it's so funny. But another thing too, like in the beginning, I made like a whole reel of my dad saying, did you hit record? Are we recording? Are we recording yet? Like he says that so many times that I was like, this would be hysterical, like repeating in 20 different ways. I literally made like almost like a laugh track of my dad asking me in like 20 different videos. Are we recording? Are we recording yet? Is it on? <laughs> Is my chin in the mic? You know, like <laughs> that's great that he's, he's conscious about that now though. That's amazing. Yeah. He's become conscious of that. He looks forward to like who I've found that wants to collaborate with us. He's like, any more for me to react to any more? Who, who are you talking to this week? You know? Nice. So it's given us something to look forward to other than the rigmarole of life. Like yeah. we have, everybody has craziness and shenanigans that they're managing. I mean, he's taking care of his 95 year old mother and I've got two sisters living abroad and you know, I've got wow. four kids I'm managing in school and business and you know this is a fun project for us to like take ourselves out of the rigmarole of life and relate to each other and and learn new things together it's so great so I, I was going to touch on this a little bit later but you just happen to bring up like everything that you're happen that's that you're doing now you know and who's involved and who you have in your family like where do you find the time to do all this marketing, all the, all, all the recording, like everything you do, because I, I like every time I'm on social media, you're there. Like you're, you're just, you're there no matter what platform it is. Like you, you, you were on. Uh, Thank you. Where, where do you and I do don't really time? schedule much other than in my Facebook group, like every Friday, Sometimes I schedule that, but sometimes I don't. Sometimes something else is happening and I'll want to say it a different way. But on Fridays, I say promote anything, promote someone, promote something good in the world. You know, I try to right. switch it up so it's not the exact same thing every week. I mean, a lot of times it is, but, you know, people know that on Friday they can promote something. Mm-hmm. And then the other things I bring up are just like, who am I talking to? And is there a question around the subject that I'm going to cover? So, like, an example is, you know, if I'm talking to somebody who's been a sperm donor to 23 children, what is your thoughts on sperm donation? Or if I'm talking to someone who's left Scientology, what are your thoughts on Scientology? Right. Uh, if I'm talking to an Orthodox Jew that is taking a different path now, you know, feedback from the audience is so essential and it's really hard to get. So I wanted to create a space where I wanted to gauge the interest of some of these topics that I was going to cover. And does anybody have questions around those that might lend to the conversation? So I can then shout that person out. And shout outs are another thing that I have realized really makes people feel good and includes people and grows your community. I've been trying to like yes. even create clips of if I talk about another podcast, like I just mentioned Reese from Leaving Scientology, I could clip that out and send it to her and be like, hey, I t- just talked about you on Basement Surge. You should check out that show. Right. Absolutely. I mean, that's a, that's a great, uh, marketing strategy. It really is. Yeah. I, I seen, I seen your clip that you posted on Facebook earlier. Uh, you had done that same exact thing. So yeah, uh, it works so well. And people have sent them to me of other people talking about me. And I was like, Oh my God, I freaking love that. I want to do that for somebody else. Yeah, absolutely. It's good. It's good promotion. I mean, both for you and the other person, you know, so it just works both ways. Yeah, I just literally did a post on LinkedIn today and was like, hey, if <laughs> if you're like overwhelmed by social media, you don't know what to post, boost somebody else sure. or share someone's profile or what's a podcast that you've been on that you enjoyed and you want to shout out the host. Yeah. It literally can be that simple. Right. Like I listen to a podcast. Yes, I listen to podcasts all the time. And if you listen to a good one, share it and say one thing about the podcast that spoke to you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You, you know, I, I think that's what a lot of podcasts don't get is that um a lot of them what they like to do is a lot of self-promotion 
right? They, they always promote, hey, listen to my new episode, check out what I'm doing, the blah, blah, blah. You know, they, they don't really promote, especially on Instagram, I noticed. Uh, a lot of them don't really promote other shows or their guests that they that they have on the show. Um, but I, I want to I read you something, okay? I found this article that somebody interviewed you, speaking of uh, your guests, uh, you had, uh, did an interview for Canvas Rebel in November of 23. Uh, and you had said it and I quote, my passion lies in sharing the narratives of outsiders because most of my life I felt like one. I've been dubbed the voice of the underdog. And so I don't think you're the voice of the underdog because I, I think a majority of your guests are pretty inspirational. You know, you've had on business owners, you've had on uh, parents, uh, screenwriters, podcasters, you know. So, it, like, a lot of the people you have on your show are inspirational. Like, so how, is that where you had wanted the show to start, where you wanted to talk to underdogs, but it really just evolved into an inspirational show, really? That's a great question. And thank you for pulling from that article. We'll have to send that clip to them. Um, I think it's all in framing. Okay. Right? Like I interviewed a guy who was former KKK and a Nazi and he <laughs> now converted to Judaism. I do think that the reason he ended up in a gang or a cult or a, <laughs> a group like that was because he himself was lacking a father figure and he was looking for camaraderie. And, you know, that when he ended up in prison, that was the group that accepted him. Yeah. But, you know, what's interesting is Jewish people actually were nice to him and tried to understand him. And that sometimes like good can outweigh darkness. And whereas his story is an inspirational story now, he did have kind of an underdog beginning. Right. So it's interesting. I'm going to actually tell you the name of the person. I remember the name of the person who said that exact quote, Dan Roth. He's, you know, a diversity and inclusion speaker and a recruiter and he worked for Amazon and he's a dad. He has twins and he's a big follower of mine. When I was working on the radio station this past year, cool.fm, he said, I am the voice for the underdog. So he related in that way. Mm -hmm. So people can be seen as an inspiration, but we're all underdogs. We're all overcoming traumas. Part of the reason I'm doing this show is so that I can learn from other people's traumas and how they've overcome things that we're all having a hard time with. Right. And they might be having a hard time with something that I haven't faced yet, or they might introduce me to something I never would have considered. <laughs> and I, I don't have to agree with what they're doing, but I can sit with what they're doing and think about what they're doing and talk to my dad about what they're doing and at least, you know, have an outside perspective. Sure. Wow. So voice of the underdog, I think we're all underdogs. Every, I mean... A very rare percentage of people aren't <laughs> underdogs. We are all having challenges in the background. That's very and true. We, yeah. And and I don't think that, I mean, I, I know personally I edit, you know, I edit some of that. I, I haven't gotten to the place where I am fully unedited and unfiltered. And I'm actually in awe of people that have gotten to the place where they're like, this is me. This is all of me. I'll share it all. You know, I've worked it all out in therapy. I'm like, damn, <laughs> I'm not there yet, but I have so much respect for people who are. <laughs> right, right. I, yeah, it's. I was looking through your library of uh, episodes that you've put out. You know, and uh, it's it it they you the guests that you do have on there are really inspirational. You know, they have some great stories. You have some great guests on, and uh, and, and I really think that that really stems from because i can't i can't let this go okay uh i think that really stems from your time on jerry springer okay oh 100 percent. <laughs> but the thing is too with that and i think even why i was able hindsight looking back to climb the rank so quickly is because <laughs> literally there were people from my dad's factory that got on the show like those stories were not far fetched from my surroundings. Oh my like, gosh! Like really? I, <laughs> yes, 
was born and raised in Kentucky, a Jew in Kentucky. That's my little outsider thing. I mean, that is a a, a rarity. Yeah. You know, people are always like, what? There's Jews there? I'm like, yeah, they're either related or now that I left, there's no more <laughs> left, you know? Like, <laughs> um, but I pretty much knew every Jew in town. Yeah. And I, I did feel like an outsider. I did feel like that was not the norm. Um, it was very black and white growing up. And right. um, I felt like another. And, you know, it wasn't honestly until I moved to L.A. in my 20s where I was like kind of like driving around through the Jewish neighborhoods. And I'm like, Shalom, you know, like trying to find my people. <laughs> but yet they're walking on the Sabbath and I'm driving and like, there's a like, not really a mix there. <laughs> so yeah, it's been years of me trying to figure out who I am within my own people. But also back to the Jerry Springer thing. I never really judged the stories that people were calling in with, I really had a curiosity to find out more. I was like, how long has that been going on? Who do you want to be with? Can you rope the others into coming? You know? Nice. Nice. And, and I think that's what made yeah. you such a great producer, I think. <laughs> I was like, oh, you know, I, I know someone like that, or I, you know, have kind of experienced those things myself. Yeah. I, back in the day, I would invite them into my office, light up a cigarette. They'd light one up too. And it was just a bonding experience. <laughs> nice. nice. So, okay. So you, you've said that you grew up Jewish. D did you grow up like strict Jew Jewish or, you know, was you, I were your parents was strict? not observant. I mean, no. my parents went to synagogue for like the high holidays. I never felt like spiritually connected to be perfectly honest. Being mm -hmm. Jewish to me was like, oh, my grandparents are Jewish and my great grandparents are Jewish and they want me to marry Jewish. So why? <laughs> you <know>? um, <laughs> And, you know, I didn't date Jewish in high school, you know, brought non-Jewish guys to the prom and then was engaged to somebody who wasn't Jewish. And then my parents, like, I think were kind of like hoping I would marry someone Jewish. And I was always like, well, maybe I can marry someone who's like part Jewish. <laughs> you know, And that's actually what I did. Like on the, on the my husband, side, you know? <laughs> I even was like, oh, maybe I could find somebody that will convert or. Right. You know, have a paid conversion or uh, some varying degree of that. <laughs> paid conversion. This isn't, this isn't marketing. <laughs> okay, like. <laughs> but yeah, you know, um, I do think it's important to kind of like know where you came from and right. know what your family has been through and why it's important to them. And I've definitely um, right. well, I, I'm, explored I'm that. I'm just br trying to bring it up only because, you know, through your career from working on Jerry Springer to the topics that you talk about now, they're, they're kind of taboo, you know, the, the, some of them are taboo, you know, um, you know, and it, I was just, I was just curious on, on how your family felt about the certain topics that you were presenting from Jerry Springer to up until, you know, up until your podcast now. Some of them have been hard. Yeah. For my dad, I actually just interviewed someone who reached out and told me that she prosecuted her grandfather for incest. Oh, and my dad, being a dad to three daughters and a brother to three sisters, and someone who has stayed married for 45 years I'm like, how old am I? And uh, <laughs> it was a very tough story for him to hear and respond to. Yeah. But I also think it's a really important subject matter. And we also covered addiction and sexual abuse and, and the ties between that. And, you know, even when I worked in the entertainment industry pre the Me Too movement, I mean, I saw a lot of things that would not go on today or yeah. might get in the media a lot quicker if they did do that today. <laughs> wow. Okay. So, so it's important to talk about things even as a parent, you know, mm -hmm. I, I wasn't pre-warned of what college and the workplace was really going to look like. My mom and dad got married right out of high school, you know, and I right. felt a little unprepared by my experience at the Jerry Springer show. <laughs> are, you, are you a little more reserved now with your own kids? Yes.
yes. actually. <laughs> Although I do talk to them much more openly about, you know, I, like I wouldn't let my daughter walk two blocks. And yet I used to run across the freeway and under the freeway and yes. hitchhike and all kinds of things. Didn't lock our doors. I got to. I got to have my key out and a taser to walk to my front door. You know? <laughs> oh, no. You, you live in a bad neighborhood. <laughs> no, I don't even. I don't. It, but the thing is, is if you live in a major city, like I've lived in Chicago and San Francisco and Houston. And right. these are big places. Yeah. yeah. You have to be situationally aware. <laughs> I don't drop off my kids at the mall for five hours alone when they're. 12 and 13. Yeah. I did that growing up in Kentucky. So did I. A lot. <laughs> so did you, right? Yeah, here in New York and Brooklyn, forget it. When I was 12 and 13, <laughs> I was walking like half a mile by myself to like the movie theater, you know, to go meet up with my friends and like my I was gone for hours. My parents never knew where I was. Yeah. You know. <laughs> No and I am calls. not by any means a helicopter parent. And I probably like, oh, my God, I yeah. watched some crazy documentaries with my kids. And I'm like, should I have even let them watch part of that? Right. Yeah. yeah. My, <sighs> my wife I and think I, it's important. We, we were watching a movie the other night. We were watching um, Dumb and Dumber. and uh, That's probably safe. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and we were watching it with my 15-year-old, right? And my... Uh, eight and five year old come walking in the room and they sit down in, on the floor and start watching the movie with us. And it's like, uh, there, there's no cursing really in the movie, but there's kind of like sexual in, innuendo and, you know, and yeah. a, a really big, you know, poop joke. But um, <laughs> that's uh, much more innocent. Like, I actually, yeah. with my 15 year old last night, watched a movie about a guy that was possessed by the devil and then the possession switched to the brother, I think. Wow. And one of them, I forgot, like killed someone. Oh. <laughs> this actually happened and then, you know, went to prison and then their whole family was torn apart. But I've actually interviewed an exorcist too, because another no podcaster sent an exorcist my way. And what was so interesting about that, first of all, a Jew interviewing an exorcist, people are like, what? Right. You know, like that right. was interesting. <laughs> And it was interesting to hear what even my dad thought about that. But my dad really related to him as a religious person. Okay. So that was kind of cool. Like my dad's a believer in God. Yeah. So he connected to him in that way. And the exorcist really said that like, oh my God, first of all, he's reached out to you by thousands of people a year. But he was saying it's really important to distinguish between mental health issues and yes. a real visiting from an evil source. Right. Right. Because just to clarify, like J Jewish people don't really believe in demons, right? You know, I don't, they, they believe in an evil inclination. It's called Yetzirah. Mm. I actually, after interviewing the exorcist, wanted to like interview like maybe a Kabbalist or like a rabbi that believed in hell or something. I'm yet to do that. So maybe may, may coming soon. <laughs> Like I, I love all that stuff, and I've 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 been dying to get an exorcist on the show. <laughs> all right, well, I'll see what I can do. Yes. <laughs> Fascinating guy, Vincent oh. Lampert. Have you heard of him? And no. and that too was a recommendation from the same person that gave me le the Leaving Scientology chick. Yeah. The thing is, is some of my you know craziest stories have been from my listeners. They're sitting in my way. They're like, you should interview this person. I'm like, great suggestion. Never would have thought to do that. And wow. and after I had that sperm donor daddy on that had been a sperm donor at the time to 23 people, I had another one reach out to me from London. He's like, oh, I've given sperm to 100 people. I was like, well, I just covered that. Hit me back in six months. <laughs> you know, I was like, that's nuts, though. <laughs> Literally. I, I... <laughs> I, I would have done the episode with him right away and then just released it six months later. That's all. True, true. I am very backed up with content. As you know, it's taken me a while to get yours out. But yes, oh, no. I sh maybe I should reach out to the 100 uh, sperm donor daddy. Yeah, that's crazy. That's wild. I'm like, when is that cut off, dude? You've got way too many kids out there. Yeah. And actually, I got into a along the sperm donation line. Um, I got into it with a, a guy yesterday about surrogacy. And this one's going to be tough on my dad because, you know, are we playing God here? Like, he's literally going to pay someone $200,000 to mm. be his egg donor and give up the baby right when it comes out. And I'm thinking to myself, wow, 
does she give her breast milk? Does she hold the baby? Does she have anything to do with the baby? I think there's all different levels of participation. And then too, like I had interviewed or talked to a girl that was combing the web for like a sperm donor, like actually at the Jewish community center is like, oh, wow, are you going to like have a kid? She's like, oh yeah, my first two were by one sperm donor, but he's like tapped out. So now I'm, I'm like, how do you even pick like eye color, height, IQ, what books they read? Yeah. Like, like fascinating is, is a whole profile. Like, I wonder how they do it. Wow. That's yeah. Crazy. I can't, I and can't then too, I was, yeah, I can't imagine. Interesting to think about. And then I was also thinking about like, what if the kid, like the kid has no choice in that. Yeah. Like literally the kid has no choice in that. Like I've interviewed a guy that was the son of two lesbians mm. and one of the lesbians roped a guy into a threesome and he didn't even know that like she was about to do a handstand and keep that baby. <laughs> <laughs> do a handstand. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> and he was raised in the LGBT community and he's like, I am straight as hell. He has four kids. Right. Wow. You know what I mean? I mean, that's wild. I, I, I had just seen a TikTok. Speaking of this, I had just, <laughs> I had just seen a TikTok of this girl that was complaining live on social media about how she's trying to get the sperm donor of her baby. She was in a lesbian relationship. Uh, she's trying to get the sperm donor to pay child support. And because her girlfriend had left her and now, and she has no job and now she needs wow. to support the baby. So she was trying to get, go to the, uh, to, to the place where she got the sperm and try to get them to give her the information on the donor and they wouldn't give it to her. Cause it's, the yeah, law. I, I should ask that hundred sperm donor guy if he's ever <laughs> been yeah. tracked down. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody out of a hundreds got <laughs> had to have been crafty. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. I, I I don't I don't think I could ever do that. I I can't. I don't know. I was even thinking about that too. Like when you're young and you're like, oh my god, two hundred thousand. But like that's your genetics. Like that's right. your egg, your baby. Like and you yeah. want nothing to do with it. I, I feel like like as a mom now of four kids, like right. that would be really hard for me. And also like you have feelings like connection to it when you're brewing it um you know when it's cooking yeah <laughs> yeah and the emotional release of you know it coming out like right. there's just so much i don't know I, I don't know if i could do that and actually i had an aunt that like asked me if i would have a baby for her i'm like maybe god didn't want you to have one you know what i mean like i don't know <laughs> Uh, maybe, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. But it is interesting <laughs> to think about all these things, and I don't mind having conversations around it. Right, right. But it and, can and, be and you know what? And difficult. And I think that that's what makes your show so great, because you you are open to t literally talking about anything, I think. <laughs> yeah, as long as they have, like, a daddy angle. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, throw in the thread. You know? <laughs> just, just as long as it works within the format. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I had somebody, I'm going to like complain for a second, but I had somebody yesterday on YouTube say to me like this concept will never like gain traction or fame. And I'm like, better call daddy. That's like literally all I said back. I was like, you obviously have a daddy story. <laughs> like, <laughs> Thank you for taking the time to like up my views from that one comment and I won't erase it. <laughs> like, <laughs> Well, can I just say that when I told my wife that you were going to be on the show, right, and I told her the name of your show, she she's like, "Excuse me, who who's coming on the show? <laughs> what?" She she thought that you were kind of like some like sexy show or something like that, you know. And I'm like, "No, no, 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 she does a show with her dad." <laughs> like, like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and you know, I I also I had this guy Eric Weinstein. He's a influencer that my husband really looks up to. He's like a crazy like physicist mathematician and he was like anything with the the word daddy in it you're good right. <laughs> he's like good yeah. keyword yeah. <laughs> right it's good for seo you know exactly i'm like god <laughs> bless you thank you can i use that as a clip so you went from working from being a producer on jerry springer and to various different shows you were on like you know court shows judge shows 
Um, which, by the way, my my wife loves those also. Um, <laughs> yes, you know, and you went. You were always behind the scenes. Why? Why did you decide to go in front of the camera, in front of to be the main event? Yeah, just like you, you know, I think today in order to get clients from it or to be taken as professional, you have to yeah. step in front of the camera. But what's right. interesting is I went from being a producer and getting into the Producers Guild and having my own office in NBC Tower and, you know, getting free smokes every week to starting all the way over, like as an executive assistant to three very seasoned producers, the Kyoto Brothers, who were the producers of Killer Clowns from Outer Space. <laughs> I heard of that. <laughs> They're actually releasing um, a new video game of that cult classic. And... Wow. Yeah, I I was willing to try different things mm -hmm. and not act like, oh, I'm a producer and I know everything, but like, hey, I'm willing to learn stuff. Right. And so I took an office job and answered phones and learned accounts payable and receivable and learned how to location scout and learned how to do payroll and you name it. Mm -hmm. And so I think in order to be successful really in anything – not only do you have to kind of put yourself out there, but you have to be coachable and be willing to learn and realize that just because you hit a certain level of success at one place, you might not reach that again for a couple of years. And truthfully, it took me working my way back up from a field interviewer to an assistant editor to a script supervisor back to a post-production supervisor years later. And then I worked the third shift on Nanny 911. That means from seven at night till seven in the morning for oh. nine months straight before I got days, which was nine to five. And oh. I think too, there's an element of luck and, and an element of, you know, being willing to say yes and, and work when you're needed. Right. Right. I, and, and you know what? I think that goes for any position. You know, not not just, you know, in the production field, you know, just really anything because, you know, I've I've worked as a janitor in schools, you know, and, uh, you know, if you don't say yes, they stop asking, you know, they, they just won't give it to you. So, you know, yeah. it, it, you have to be eager. You have to you have to want to grow. You have to want to learn, I think, you know, and uh, and especially in entertainment, you know, especially in, in that totally, kind of field, you know, so um Talk to me a little bit about the production value of your show, okay? Because I noticed that you do a lot of, like, you shoot from the hip a lot. You know, you do your live shows from your cell phone, you know, and uh, a lot of it's, like, raw, you know, and I love that. So, you know, talk Thank to me a you. little bit about that. Yeah, even in the beginning of when I was kind of introing the show, I would be walking through my neighborhood in the spring and the winter and the fall and kind of like showing people who I am and where I live. I mean, not exactly where I live, but like, look where I'm walking, look, you know, and, and here's what we talked about. And yeah, I literally had like the Apple, I should even share one of these old clips. They were so much fun to make. You know, it was me pu pushing my baby stroller and and saying, hey, here's what's upcoming. And in the beginning, too, I only did audio. And then I had a guest on, Miron Kirkosian. He's the first one. And he has a huge YouTube channel. I should mm -hmm. re-even air some of his video clips. But he was a backup dancer to Madonna and Britney Spears and Selena uh -huh. Gomez and all these big stars. And he took the little audio clip that I sent him. And he was like, hey, you should, like, throw some video clips in there with that. And I was like, oh, I didn't even think to do that. Right. You know, in the beginning, I just thought a podcast was audio and he showed me how to cut it up and make it more interesting. And then from there, I started doing these walks and, and, and letting people know, hey, this is what we talked about. This is what you can expect. And then from there, I was like, oh, wow, maybe I should actually include the guests in that or some B-roll. It, it's such an evolution of how we share. But then the live thing actually came from me seeing other podcasters doing that, like, yeah. Hey, after somebody's on your show or if their show is getting ready to air, hop on a live with them, see what they're up to, you know, listen to the conversation that you all had. And is there something that you all didn't cover that you could now tag on and, you know, peak, peak the audience's attention by saying, Hey, this is what we covered. Here's what I forgot to talk about and have a listen. Right. Right. That's, that's great. But, uh, Take me through your stalking process, okay? Like, because I had heard you talk about this before. 
Okay. Yes. And I love it because it's like I've had I do I do quite a bit of research before I have a guest on a show, right? And I call I can it tell. talking also. You know, (laughs) I can tell and I appreciate that. Yes. I mean, from the Canvas Rebel article to, you know, the family questions to, yeah, knowing the format of my show. So many great questions. Thank you so much for that. Um, The stalking process. Part of that I actually learned from another podcaster, Sean Dillon at Beyond the Mic. Okay. He also was a bit of a mentor to me when I took this little radio job at cool.fm. And one thing I learned was... If you go on Twitter and you you type responses, you can read all of how somebody responds on the internet. Really? That is such a really cool trick. Yeah. If you go to somebody's Twitter and then you go to see how they respond. Yeah. So you can learn about people that way. And then too, like go to somebody's LinkedIn and look at all their activity. See, are they going to events? See what books they're reading. See what they're posting. See the language that they use. And you can pull from the language that they use in asking them questions because it's it makes it more comfortable for them if you know how they tell their story or how they talk. Mm. Wow. So those are two really good tips. Another thing I learned from working at the radio station was instead of talking to your listeners or talking to your audience is talk to one person. Right. And also you might want to put like a picture of you and one of your kids next to your computer or a picture. I had Jerry Springer next to me. Actually, I still do. <laughs> do you really? um, yeah. Wow. Can you see that? Whoop. Let's see. Yeah, it's very dusty. Yeah. There. Yeah. There you go. That's cool. Yeah. You know, somebody who believed in you or somebody where you got your start or somebody who you feel like you can comfortably talk to, like have them next to your computer for when you're doing an intro or when you're doing a promo or when you're doing an outro, pretend like you're talking to that person and then it makes it sound different. That, that's that's a good point. Yeah, That's a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> Or because- pretend you're talking to one of your kids. Like, how would you explain something to them? It takes a really long time, and I'm sure you know this, yeah. to just be able to have a conversation like we're having comfortably, like where it doesn't even sound like there's a mic or a computer screen. It right. feels like almost we're just sitting next to each other having a conversation. Yeah. I mean, well, that's really what it's supposed to feel like. But I mean, especially yeah. like when I'm by myself, you know, like if I'm doing a solo episode and and like I noticed in my own verbiage you know i'll i'll talk to everybody you know whereas i should be focusing on one person you know because it's only really one person listening or watching (laughs) at at a time you know so (laughs) or ever but yeah Yeah, it does kind of i mean i realized that even in radio (laughs) yeah if, if like i think that's why i don't get nervous actually talking on a microphone through a computer or talking on a microphone at a radio station because I can't see the amount of people that are listening. And I think if I could, it would make me a lot more nervous. Right. (laughs) So I I, want to, I want to move over to talking about branding. Okay. Uh, I, I wanted to pick your brain about what do you think is more important Business branding or personal branding? Ooh, personal branding because okay. I, I just from the branding work that I have done, I have mm-hmm. noticed you get a lot more interaction from your personal account. Okay. I have a Better Call Daddy Twitter. I have a Better Call Daddy Facebook page. I have a Better Call Daddy LinkedIn business page. Nobody engages with that unless you like at sign it and include it in your personal posts. People want to connect with people. And I even think this for, you know, I've talked to many founders. I'm like, if you want people to love your brand, they need to love you first. Right. I think the more you can humanize your brand, people are going to be interested in what you do. Right. Because because I, I think of people like uh, Gary Vaynerchuk. Have you, have you heard mm-hmm. of him? Right. Yeah, I've met him. Uh, okay well uh, <laughs> you know like i watch his videos all the time you know and none of it is under vayner media none of it is under his company names right it's all under gary v like it's under his personal brand so you know and and i think because uh, i was actually talking to my wife uh for the, 
basically for like the past month about this where I've, I've been trying to figure out like what's more important, personal brand or business brand, you know, and trying to really get a, get a handle on what, what direction I want to take with uh surge and all this. But uh, so, so it's something that I'm currently going through, you know, and uh, I wanted to pick your brain about it, but um, I mean, people need to know that you are basement surge. Right. But then they're also going to be like, well, who are you? <laughs> right. <laughs> so, nobody really knows or cares who I am. So, <laughs> so, I think they would. I think they would. Yeah. So, uh, you know, like I have, I have my personal page. Like I, it's funny because on my personal Facebook page, I have more followers and, and more likes and all that than I do for basement surge. Exactly. You know, so I think I'm going to start trying to build up the, the personal brand a lot more, you know, nowadays, I think. because And you it, can associate it with Basement sure. Surge and with your business. But I yeah. think, yes, it's easier to build a personal brand mm -hmm. than a business brand because people want to engage with people, not businesses. Right. Right. No, I, I get that. Even the brands that I like, I'm like, who are the founders? Who can I connect with at the brand that I can have as a contact? Right. Well, well, well no. and, that, and that's the thing, because then you have like brands like Nike, let's say, like, I don't know who runs Nike. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> you know, or, you know, just those famous brands. But but then you have to think about, all right, well, you know, I'm not a famous brand, you know, and uh, no, nobody really knows the, the BS logo right now, you know, all over the world like they do Nike. Uh, so why would they care kind of thing, you know? So it's better to build as a small creator, I think. It's better to build a personal brand than it is to build the business brand because that personal brand, even though right now, let's, let's say right now I'm doing basement surge, right? Who knows next year I could stop doing this show and move on to something else. And all those followers will come with me. A hundred percent. Oh my God. If I told you how many times my LinkedIn, you know, what I do has changed, <laughs> <laughs> but my followers have all stayed and they're, they they want to know what the next evolution of Rena is for right. sure. Okay. Okay. Yes. Right, I so think it's, you can change your story at any point, Yeah. but people connect with people. Yeah. That, that's great advice. Great advice. Um, yeah. And, and which is funny because I think that the, the last question I was going to ask you would, which was what's the best advice for possibly, all right. What's the best advice for getting sponsorships for a podcast? What do you think? Do stats really matter? No. No. That's actually, that's a great question. Yeah. Stats matter if you want people to pay you per CPM, but that's right. not how you're really going to be able to like uh, pay for anything. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like um, I have gotten paid that way. And I've also gotten paid like if you have a big guest and somebody wants to attach, you know, their product or offering around a specific guest, you could say, okay, well, for that episode, I'm charging 150. Right. And then you'll be the only sponsor on it. And you'll mm -hmm. be a part of that episode forever. So there's different ways you can even set up sponsorships. It can be dynamically where it plays for a certain amount of time, or it can be in the front, it can be in the middle, it could be in the end. In the beginning, I didn't even know that. So I was selling sponsorships cheap and they were baked in forever. So if you listen to my first 10 episodes, although I did take it off of one of them, I re-edited it out because I didn't feel like it was appropriate with the guest. But if you listen to nine out of the 10 of my first episodes with Manscaped, <laughs> um, <laughs> it's still in there. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, and, and the way I reached out to them was, hey... Uh, I know you're a controversial brand and I'm going to cover some controversial stories and I have worked for many podcasters and right now my prices are cheap and when I grow an audience, my prices are going to go up and you'll right. be the exclusive and you'll be there forever. Do you want to take a shot on me? I know you take a shot on a lot of podcasters. So it was something like that. Plus, I had booked one of the VPs at an event that I 
was helping book sponsorships for and doing marketing around. So I already had a relationship within the organization. I think that that helps. If there are tools that you use, like here's a shout out now. I love Headliner. It's super easy to use. And I saw them shouting out podcasters in their newsletter. And I saw them doing like podcaster features. I was like, hey, how do I get to be one of those? And then they wrote me back and they hopped on a call with me. And I have done a couple campaigns with them. And I think that their mission is really to get, you know, podcasts in front of other podcasters, which I like because they're trying to grow a community of podcasters. And I think that's cool. And so I have a partnership going on with them right now. And it was simply just doing some research, reaching out to a tool that I actually used. I've also gotten sponsors where I do like in-kind trades, like, hey, my kids really love these organic protein snacks that you make, the I1 organics. And uh, if you send me a couple of boxes of those, I'll make some social media posts and do a read on the basement surge about how awesome I1 organics are. <laughs> uh, go, go buy them now. <laughs> Same thing with Barnana. Or what are the other ones? Hippies. My kids loved hippies. And I was doing different events. And I saw that they were into event marketing. And I was like, hey, there's going to be X number of people at this event. How about I'll hand out your hippie snacks to all the people there. And I'll take pictures. And I'll put it all over my social media. And I'll send you all the pictures afterwards. What do you think? Yes. That's great. So it's just coming up with different ways in which you can make it mutually beneficial. And what would make it mutually beneficial? I would start with that question. Yeah. So you actually uh, approach the companies of products that you actually use. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Now, and and do you try to have the products line up with the content that you have in your episode? I should have thought about that more strategically in the beginning. (laughs) No. (laughs) Yes. I think it's a good idea to do that. Okay. But I, yeah, didn't. That's actually why I removed one of the ads because I had a Jeffrey Epstein survivor and then talked about Manscaped products. Oh, boy. <laughs> I was like, uh, yeah. that didn't uh, feel right. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. Uh... <laughs> All right, uh, Rena, last question. Uh, my wife would kill me if I didn't ask you this. Uh, any crazy stories from working on the judge shows? <laughs> oh, of course. I mean, the majority of those stories are landlord-tenant disputes. Yeah. But when you find one that isn't, that's the gold. I mean, some of those landlord-tenant ones can be good mm-hmm. if there's like a throwdown or something. But yeah, I had one that was like a case over like a a dispute where a chick threw one of those like metal water bottles at like, I think her landlord's vehicle. (laughs) I mean, that's gold. She like caused some serious small claims damage (laughs) with those. (laughs) Oh man. All right. Rena, thank you very much for coming on. Uh, Do me a favor. Tell everybody where they can find you. You can find me on all social at Rena Friedman Watts. I have a free Facebook group called Business Laughs and LinkedIn, because I believe if you're not laughing while you're having business, then you'll be less successful. <laughs> and bettercalldaddy.com. Awesome. Awesome. All of uh, Rena's links will be down in the show notes below, everybody. So go check them out. Uh, and of course, if you want more Basement Surge, head on over to surgemediany.com. All right, Rena, thank you very much. Thank you. Everybody should leave you a five-star review and subscribe. Yes, please do. All right, everybody. That was a great episode that uh, I had with Rena. We had so much fun hanging out, talking shop, talking podcasting, talking marketing, talking about her history, about where she came from, really. Uh, We talked a lot about marketing and branding. and It's just there was... We touched on so many different topics within this episode, and uh, and I loved it. I had a great time. Uh, thank you very much, Rena, for coming on the show. I uh, I hope you come on again, and uh, maybe next time we'll expand on certain topics. But um, thank you so much for coming on. I had a blast. All right, everybody. So for more from Rena, head down to the show notes where I put all the links of everything that she's doing right now. Her podcast 
her private Facebook group, her all of her social links. Go check it out. Follow her. Subscribe to her show. And, uh, and, and share. Share her show. Because she is doing some amazing things over on Better Call Dan. And of course, if you want more episodes of The Basement Surge, head on over to basementsurge.com, where basically everything coming out of the basement is right there. All right, guys. So the last thing I want to talk about is that April is Parkinson's Awareness Month. Okay. If you're a true fan of The Basement Surge, you know since day one, we've partnered with the Michael J. Fox Foundation for Parkinson's Research, and we've helped them raise money in the past. So all this month, we are running a fundraiser called Team Surge, the Surge for the Cure, over on our website. So head on over there. 100% of your donation goes over to the foundation. So don't forget, this whole month of April is Parkinson's Awareness Month. Join Team Surge in the Surge for the Cure. I'll see you next time. Let's, Let's go. go! Turn up the volume. The volume. The volume. From the basement of the Empire State, this is the Basement Surge. Three.